Oh, good afternoon. Welcome to EuroBC Con. There's uh, an uh, announcement from the um, from the organizers. Uh, if um, please look to your right, and if there is a or, or <laughs> if you're on that that um, side on uh, on your left, um, if there is a free space I I would do uh, to either side of you, Don't please worry. move over because people will be arriving late for the session. Um, and uh, yeah, I see people still arriving, but we're trying to keep the schedule here. So uh, please welcome Martin here, who is a an OpenBC developer who's been taming the network stack. So take it away, Martin. Thank you very much. So thanks you for being here. Uh, as Peter said, uh, I'm an OpenBSD developer. I'm a bit late into the party. That's an interesting fact for the talk I'm giving right now because. I'm mostly working on what I'm going to talk about is about code that is older than I am. Um, as you can see with the name of the presentation, I'm going to, buy, to talk about network. Network, what exactly? I found a really funny name that comes from a joke that I would explain a bit later. So timing those OpenBSD network stack dragons. Uh, for those that don't really know me, um, I spend a lot of time in OpenBSD kernel as a day job uh, to the network, and during the night working on USB, poor PC, or some different stuff there and here. So what I'm going exactly to talk about, what are those dragons that, well, I'm mentioning in this slide? The first, or maybe the easier way to present or to introduce you to those dragons, it's to, let's read a comment that you can find if if you're looking at to the, the network code uh, inside the OpenBSD source tree in the kernel, uh, that's an interesting question. That I, to, to adapt my talk, I, I want to know maybe how many person are um, familiar with, with the internal of, of the, the BSD networking subsystem, or maybe are, are coding. Maybe can you raise your hand if, if you know something about that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so I, I tried to adapt the, the language. So the comment I was talking about, uh, you can find it in this, in this file. And um, as you can see, when we are afraid of something, <laughs> we call it a dragon. A dragon is, is a legendary animal. I don't know how many of, of, of you already s have already seen a dragon. I didn't, but the effect that dragon can do, at least in, in, a, in a kernel, are quite terrific. Um, this, this talk could have been named How to Badly Break Your Network Stack. Uh, it comes out of a joke that, that uh, I say, well, that's really interesting stuff that I don't know how many people know about the BSG story, this design. Why do you want to break that? Why do you want to change that? That's a really interesting question. So I tried to do a talk here in 45 minutes. A lot of people already told me that if I want to explain what I did and how many times I break the, the network stack, uh, it wouldn't fit in one talk. So I'll try to be short here, but don't hesitate to ask questions to have further details. So what are the motivation that leads me to, to, to look for those dragons, those creatures that, that are in your 30 years old, a bit more than 30 years old uh, operating system in this code there? That's the first part of the agenda, right? After that, since we are talking here about network, um, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with the notion of addresses and, and routes. Uh, is it right, the right place to talk about that? Well, you will tell me. But I will introduce that and, and specifically how, from my point of view, as, as, an, as a network uh, developer, as a, as a kernel network developer, we choose, or at least I was told, that the BSD people, the guy in Berkeley, decide to represent them. That's really interesting to understand how they are represented. Because since I, I'm looking into this, this network stack and I found a lot of dragon there, I want to understand where they are living and why we could find some dragons. Then the change that leads me to break stuff, that the change, why, why would you like to break stuff? What, what kind of change can break stuff? What kind of change did we do on OpenBSD that none of the other BSD did? that we found some specifically complex design decision on, on the original BSD kernel in the network stack. Where those changes led us 
That's the point of, of now. And finally, I will conclude about this experience, which represents about one and a half year of, of, of work. So feel free to interrupt me if you have some question, if I'm not clear. Uh, as I said, there's a lot to say, but I think we can manage to see all, the, all, the, all of the slides. So first point, the motivation. What brings me here to talk about those dragons, right? Well, the first point is obviously to give a talk to the Euro BSD con. That's, that's what every BSD developer are, are working for. Um, you might like, as I am, to enjoy code of the 80s. I, I was born in the 80s. After this, the code I'm touching has been written, and well, it's interesting. I'm, I was not particularly interested in, in history. Well, it's interesting. But the, why I enjoy this code, or I don't enjoy this code, <laughs> it's because I would like to make it easier for other people, for myself, to run it in parallel. Um, I don't know if it rings some bells here. Uh, computer used to have one central processing unit. Now, as a day job, um, my employer wants to sell router based on, on OpenBSD. He wants to sell routers that are fast. That's something, well, I don't know, people are interested in fast software. And one of the ways to, to make it faster, at least that's what they told me, um, that's what they, they hire me for, uh, is to execute it on multiple CPU. So, what I'm, I'm writing here on, on the sub point of, of making it run in parallel is that the, the motivation and the important motivation that leads me to, to make the change network stack is to be able to make it easier to simplify the code that we want to run in parallel. And I will be focusing on the forwarding path because uh, the company that makes router are really interested in those performance. It's quite a long talk. It's quite a big piece of code, but it's interesting. Um, I'm presiding on the second part that I took an approach that I uh, wrote on top because other developers are approaching this, this question of running code on multiple CPU. And it's interesting when we work in software development if we work as a team, so we share the work. Some people, uh, as a position of the top, I could say the bottom, that are addressing or interested in the problem directly from the um, close to the hardware, so from the driver system, allocation, allocation mechanism. I will look more at something which is um, even for people that don't really do um, operating system development can understand. It's, it's um, basically the top, what we call IOCTL, that's what's, what's the process when they enter the, the kernel to do some configuration change, do what kind of, of, of data they want to write, modify, uh, and, of course, the, the code that we run when we want to send a packet from one interface to another one. That's what I mean when I write IP forward path. Now, an interesting point about this work, is I mean, when, you, when you think about a strategy that, that you have to uh, deploy, that you have to change to make it run in parallel, or at least to help it make it run in parallel, is that a lot of, of the tricks are also true for plug-and-play Problematics. That means that when you plug an interface that I ap appear to work on, on USB to, so I know what I'm talking about, that when you plug an interface and remove it, somehow the current state change, that you were representing an interface, you, you, your computer in the memory is some information, and, and you're removing that. Uh, how do you manage to, to maintain the integrity of your kernel? It's, it's, bit, it's similar, and I will come to a bit more detail later. And the last point is, I think, interesting to, to, to explain it for people that are not really familiar with the, the process development on the OpenBSD Open community, uh, is that it's probably impossible, at least even if I, with, with the team of people I'm working, to test all the change. So when we have such huge code, code base, and, and I think that, that Ted was... was uh, uh, saying something similar in the previous talk that you can only find all the bug when, or at least a lot of the bug, when you're really running the code in production, or when you're really running in the use case, that sure, your regression tests help you, sure, you can have a test setup, and you should, but 
we want it to commit it early so that people can try it. It will find bug, it always broke something. It's reverted so that people can still use OpenBSD, otherwise they don't trust us anymore. It's a broken system. How can you use a current system which is broken? Fix it. I should add apologize in between. Every comma is basically apologize because I break the machine of something and commit it again. <laughs> and repeat with the next step. So. <laughs> so that's the motivation that lets me, okay, why do I want to change something? Why, do, why changing something is hard and break something? That's what's coming afterward. What are those dragons? So let's go to representation um, of addresses and routes, which is basically um, the blocks to, to represent, to, to imagine this abstraction that is a, a network. No questions so far? Okay. Well, maybe you, you, you're a bit familiar with that. Um, what is an address? What do we use addresses for? Um, this might be superfluous uh, or trivial for some people, but I wrote on the left side of this slide two questions. And those two questions are really interesting because everywhere in the kernel, in the, in the network park, when you want or you access some, somehow the representation of a network address, it's to ask one of those two questions. Identify peer, that's who receive, who should receive, or who supposedly sent the packet. That's, that's a question. Basically to know, is it for me? Did you, did you send that, that, that cat to me? And the second question is, where should I send the, an the answer? Where sh should I send something? On the right-hand side, um, you see a picture representing um, the, uh, a fixed header of uh, version 4 of the IP protocol. I will be concentrating on, on, the, on, the, on the code touching the IP protocol. Um, and as an example, the version 4, we can talk about the version 6, but I will prefer to keep that for later. Um, an interesting point that I put in red, the information that corresponds to, to, to the question on the left. And this, this chunk of, 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 this representation of chunk of data, we cannot choose to change it. That's, that's something that we have to deal with. That's really interesting, that as, as an operating system developer, uh, as, as an architect, you can decide to represent things as you want. Why a table is this size? Why do you want to paint this color? leads to a lot of funny bike shading. That's interesting. But that we cannot change it, so we have to work with that. Now, in opposition to this, oh, before the, before the opposition, oh yeah. What's happened um, in, your, in, your, in your kernel, what's happened in your operating system when you, when you receive a packet? What happened when you send a packet? In, in, in order to, to give support to my words, I draw a simple picture that I will be illustrating with, with more programming a question later on. On the left hand side, you see that, well, you have some input. I won't go into detail how does it work, but you have a packet. Your machine has a packet. The question you are asking is, is this packet for me? Well, because if it's for you, you want to look at it. That's what I put on, on, on the right hand side. So you deliver the packet. By delivering, I mean, you transmit the packet to whoever is supposed to receive it on your operating system, which application. But there are a lot of possibilities. But what's interesting here is the question, is it for me? This question, I journey to the, to the identity point that I previously presented on the side. Now, if it's not for you, and for some reason, you appear to want to send this packet to, to another computer. I don't know if some of you have, have your router equipment, if you use a, I don't know, Wi-Fi access point uh, in conferences or in your home. Well, they certainly send this packet to, to somebody else. That's what, what we call forwarding. So do you ask a question, well, I'm supposed to forward this packet. There's a various question to say yes or no. And if, if you appear to, to, to be able or to want to forward this packet, then you have to say, well, 
but where? Typically, when you plug your computer to, to uh, a switch, a router, it has multiple ports. How does it know which port you're going to send the packet? Does it, is it supposed to send to all? We can go to history about that, but as an operating system, OpenBSD has a mechanism to, to select well where he's going to send it. If you have only one cable, basic traditional laptop, it will be easy because you will be receiving always from the one, from this cable and sending to this cable. And that's basically what I'm, I'm, I'm writing on, on the left-hand side when I see send. If you're sending a packet, if you're sending information, well, you just have to pick, well, which port, which interface I'm going to send to and send it. Now, this question, which interface you want to use? It's basically the question, where, where I am you supposed to? Which route do you want to take? Or do you, do you want to tell the packet to, to take? That's the, the second question that are inside this forwarding path. Now, these questions are present in different places in the kernel. But I will, I'm going to concentrate on, on, on this particular code path because that's what critical performance, that's code is executed for every packet you are passing through. So if that code is slow, well, you will have a slow forwarding machine. And if you want to make it fast, you have to understand how it works. That's what we are going to talk about. Now, I, I, I show the, the representation of, of the, the IP packet, head, IP header. Uh, how is it represented in your kernel? Uh, I hope you're not scared with some uh, C structure declaration. Uh, with some love from Berkeley, but in your, in your kernel, um, and I come back a bit later, uh, I think this structure got introduced in 85, uh, something around that, and it's basically containing the information that you want to match to the packet you're going to receive. Is this an address that it's configured on an interface on your system? That's the first field, even if you don't understand the C semantic, you can read the comment that's quite explicit. Uh, is it a destination address? If you have a point-to-point -point interface, that's, that's for point-to-point. -point. Um, here we are, re it's, it's a, a reuse trick. I, if you appear to have a broadcast address configured um, on, on this interface, that is full of dragon, for example. That's something that, well, People want to save space at some point, so no need to add another field. Now, when you have some generic code that deals with addresses, and that might know if this field is representing a, point, a destination address or a broadcast address, because it's, it's, it's the same field. So there you can have a lot of crash. The, the rest of, of the, the field are quite self explainable One interesting point, and then we come back to that right, right after, is that you have a pointer, that means that you have a link that shows you which interface this address is configured on. When you do ifconfig, the name of your interface, that address, maybe some of you do, well, that's the interface, let's say EM0, the IFP that, I'm, that is used in, in, in our language of, of developer. And, and the address that you will put on this interface command will, will end up encoded in this field. So how does that glue together to draw a picture uh, in the memory representation of, of your kernel. Well, let's start simple. Start simple. Um, you boot your, your computer. Of course, what I'm talking here, I, I, I forgot to mention that previously, right? Um, I'm obviously talking about how is it in OpenBSD. But most of it applied to all of the BSD system because they, they share the same stack, right? Uh, with some detail. I will mention right now. So you boot, you boot your, your machine. You boot your machine. Um, it appears that you have a network interface in your machine. At least one, let's say. We are, we are in 2013. Um, what this network interface is here represented by the EFP symbol, right? IFP. On top of that, um, you have what I call a, uh, the um, interface list. This square rectangle means that the, this list is a global structure. Name of the slide is global data structure. Which element or list trees uh, pointing to object can be reached from anywhere in your kernel? That's, that's really similar um, 
that the kernel is just a simple uh, program which global variable, let's say. So you have a global variable that you can use to reach interface. This one is the interface list, or list of interface. So you have an interface, and it's in the list. Now, this slide represents more or less what was in, in OpenBSD 5, 4, and before, where every time you had an interface, you had what I wrote it, a link layer address, a physical address associated to this interface. No matter which kind of interface. No matter if this interface really has a physical interface. It was present. It was always present. It was always present, so it's like one-to-one -one mapping with your, with your interface, right? You have an interface, you have a link layer address. The, the um, arrow that are represented there, so you see the arrow that comes from the interface back to the interface, to, from the address back to the interface, is this field that you see here, the back pointer to the interface. I hope I'm not too confusing. Don't hesitate to stop me if I am. Now, the interesting point is that you see that there is a red arrow starting from the interface and going to the address. This represents a list of addresses configured on the interface, right? So you boot your system. You have an interface. You put it in the list. You add a physical address, and you put it on the list of the interface, right? Now, since this address, this, this physical, this link layer address, let's say, is represented like any other address, in OpenBSD, and it's still true right now, it, no, it's no longer true since some months, but in 5.4 it was true, it was also ending up in a red-black tree, which is also a square, well, rectangle, which means it's another global data structure. That's something you can access from anywhere, any kind of network code can use it to reach your address. So what we see here is that if you start using any kind of code in your kernel, you can find the representation of your address by, two different, by using two different structures. Either you say, well, let's look at the interface I have on the list and which address they have on every interface. Or, well, look at the tree what address did we put in that? That's representation of an interface without address, right? No question? Okay, let's put an address on this interface. That happened. It's a bit scary. And I don't have a picture when I work with that. It's almost... Well, there's a lot of stuff missing. <laughs> but then I will scare everybody. <laughs> Okay, so now we are adding an IP address, right? You, you did your if config command. So what I'm calling if file on, on, on the bottom of the slide is the representation that just, I've just shown before that will contain the address you just configured on your interface. This if file, as you see, there is a, a, red, a red arrow pointing to it. That means that it is also in the list of addresses of your interface. That's it's part of the interface. You did I've config EM0, blah, blah. Then this blah, blah is on EM0 list. Since it's an address, it's also appearing in the tree. All the address, we, are put in the, we put them there. Since it's an IP address, well, we, we find another structure. That's because it's easier for us to work with that. So we have another global structure that we can reach from anywhere that points to this address. And now, um, since you want to use this address in the real world, you want to say, well, I would like to reach the EuroBSDCon website. So you say, well, where should I send this packet so that it reads a EuroBSDCon server hosting the website? Well, certainly you should use the address that's configured, because if you have only one address, it's probably the good one. But the mechanism that, that, that decide, that makes the decision of destination, one of the two questions I was presenting before, is done through the routing table. So the routing table contains 
root entry that I wrote there as RT entry. So the entry say, well, it's just a pass, it's just a root, go there. But what's interesting in our point is that those root entry are pointing also to the address because that's the address you want to use in the end. Now, it appears that the routing table is also a rectangle. So if you follow the not to sleep after lunch, you get that it's also a global structure. That's what I'm going to talk about. Why is that interesting? Because when you look at this picture, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with multiprocessor development, uh, concurrence history, but the first problem that you have is that, well, if I have so many structure where I have the data of my address, then first of all, I have to make sure that they are coherent. Because if one doesn't get the change that I just did on that my address, what will happen to my network? Well, you will find dragons on your, on your operating system. Something will break. And that's, that was already a point. We are not executing, accessing this kind of, of resources in parallel. But even for configuring these resources, configuring these, these global data structures, it's complicated. I won't mention names, drivers, but we can talk about it with beers. Now, apart from coherency, as soon as you're going to say, well, I want to add a new address, and at the same time ask the question, where sh which, which route should I use to send this packet? You might end up modifying or accessing one of those four global structures at the same time and potentially uh, crashing your kernel. I won't go into the detail of why, but the point is you have to protect somehow those global states when you're working in, in, in multiple, um, in parallel um, programs. So the question is, well, okay, start looking at that without pictures. It's an incomplete picture, Claudio said, and he's right. Now, if we look just at that and we say, well, I have to make that code accessing to that work in parallel, well, I wish me good luck because I'm already scared just at looking at the picture. So the question was, well, if I have to make that code written in the 80s run in parallel, would it be better first to start to simplify it? Because you see, you have four different ways to reach to your address. Do you really need four different ways? Well, the answer is no. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving a talk here. And that's what I'm going to explain. But most importantly, before starting to say, well, which one of them we can use? Let's say where they're used. So you have four rectangles, four global structure. You remember this picture? Well, the first question we were asking is, is it for me, the packet? Identifying who is the receiver of the packet? Well, to do that, we use three of the structure. This is mainly known in the function for the version four of the IP protocol in IP input. Once again, that's represent how OpenBSD 5.4, um, what, what was in Open, OpenBSD 5.4. I will come to what's now, right? Um, this is, I, I, I didn't really check, but uh, I encourage people from the other BSD to go look, and I don't know how true it is, but I, I assume it's mostly the same. Now, if you're supposed to forward the packet, you're going to access one global structure. And when you're sending a packet, at least three of them. Now, you have a star here, because in the case of your forwarding, you're also sending, obviously. But you won't access the routing table twice. It's one or the other. So I put it here because you might just want to send a packet, right? In this case, you will use the routing table in the select interface block that we see here, that is represented by the IP output function. Excuse me? 
Yeah, well, we could include it, but it's, it's, it's due to the question to make it clear for the code, right? So we have the picture of how scary it is, of at least one small piece, how scary it is. Now, we mostly know in this particular function or piece of code, which is executed when you forward the packet, where they are accessed. That means that they are also accessed in different code paths, but I only have 45 minutes. Now, the question is, what can we do? What has been done? How that change? And sadly, well, what break in the meantime? So, first question is, we have four of these global structure. How can we reduce the number to how many of them? Which one should we pick? Now it's quite easy to say, because the work has been mostly completely done. So I wrote down some rules that might be useful for other people, I don't know, about the global list. The first point I explained when I was showing the representation of a kernel that just boot without configured address is that the link layer address, no matter what kind of interface you have, no matter if, if it's a real interface or not, no matter if it has a link layer address or not, has a memory chunk which is used by the kernel to represent something that should be the link layer address. So if you always have it, why would you look for it? Because you know it will be present. Why would you have to search to release? Where is it? It's there. Don't worry. So just remove the look the least lookup that look for it. First rule. That's quite easy to do and quite interesting. There's an interesting point that, that about the design of, of SOCAD or DEL. That I, uh, if you're using also user land, used to, to do user land uh, networking programming or works with demons, it's an interesting API um, to take an example of something that you should not do. I won't go into the detail, but that's quite interesting over a beer. The second rule is, well, I show on, on the picture that you have these red arrows, right? So if, if you already know which IFP, by IFP I mean interface, right? You remember the, where you port, where you're going to, to plug your cable into. It, the, the packet is coming through or you're supposed to send it to, right? If you already know that, why would you lose to, to look in all the possible interface in your system to find an address that you know that is on this, configured on this IFP, on this interface? Well, second rule, just use this local list, as I, as I named them. There's something that might be, I don't know, obvious for some people, but when you work with code that is older than you are, sometimes with carry commit messages, you end up looking at functions that you have really no idea why they're doing a loop. And sometimes you can just kill them. So you have to go back in time, look in the CSRG ar archives, say, why is that here? Why did they wrote that in the first time? Oh, but it's not needed. Well, <laughs> remove that. I, 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 when I see this kind of chunk, Wow, I'm really, really late. When I, I will be late. <laughs> when I see this kind of chunk, I say, well, thankfully, I, I didn't go deeply into protecting those chunks because you can simply remove them. And finally, and I will explain why a bit later, um, if you don't have to use one list, just use the interface list. If it has to be one, well, just reduce to one. So here you have some example of what have been changed in some function. You can go look at it. Coming to the interface list, I'll be a bit short about that, but what's really interesting is the history of, of, of this structure that represents all the interface that you have on your system. When it was, what, it, what I looked, when I look at the history of the, of the BSD um, code, I saw that in 81, every interface has only one address. So you have a perfect match between Looking at your interface, you already got your address, like I was saying for the, for the link layer address. 
And actually, those functions that I used to iterate over this list were not named alpha, but if, like interface. What's really interesting is that when you look at this code, none of this code wants an address. They want to know the interface which has an address, or they want to know if an interface has an address. So we, are, we have a lot of useless code because this API got written for something totally differently that is used for. Now, when in 85, the structure that I presented before, that representing an address, got introduced, well, the loop that used to be just iterating over one list of interface matching addresses, that's got changed into a loop iterating over the interface and a loop for each interface iterating over addresses, which in some system right now, when you have a lot of interface, a lot of addresses, is really slow looking on this list. That's why in 2010, a tree, a red-black tree was introduced to make this look up faster. And you know, an interesting point is the other structure I was talking about, the, the, the um, per protocol address. That's the name of, of the IPv4 version. Also got introduced in 85. Basically, I couldn't find the reason why it's really easier to write code when you know that all the IP address are there instead of all the addresses. This list is used in the version for the protocol. And this one, too, that got replaced by the, uh, the, the red-black tree, as I presented before on the slide, uh, when you decide to forward a packet to know, is it my address? One interesting point is that when the IPv6 got integrated and, and, and came, people explained the choice they did in 99. They said, we will, go, we will use the routing table for that to know if the address that's the destination of the packet, is our, our system or not. They use basically a hack to do that. But that's where we are now in OpenBSD. The solution or the, evo the evolution of the network hack is to use the routing table for all those operations regarding searching an address. Routing table are not really used for that. Or we're not designed for that, but we can use that. So what I did is consolidate what I call the loopback hack from that came implemented. That's to say, well, if this address is configured on your system, that it's somehow related to your loopback address. I hope loopback address, the low zero or something. The consolidation came with an indication with flag. OK, this route represents a local address, so it got a local fl flag. For IPv4, we need also the information of the broadcast addresses that are associated to your unicast addresses. So we also have this information, like we had root to subnets. Now, with this change, we can go to only one global structure. So no problem of co coherency between the structure. Only one focus that we have to protect, then we have to think about how to use it and correctly use it to be run on multiple CPU. And the test that we run in order to choose the solution, and that were also confirmed by the paper talking about the red-black tree, or the paper um, that, that was written for, from the KM, KM guy, that is not slower or faster than the actual tree that we are using for looking addresses. Since I don't have time, I will skip this slide. That was a good example of why you need to change uh, the structure, and I will get directly to some related changes because I'm here focusing on, on the forwarding pass and the global structure. But thinking about how to make uh, a subsystem or an entire kernel, um, I would say MP safe or, or easier to run on multiple CPU, can lead you to rethink completely the design of, of those subsystems, of those programs. So as I said before, Removing the loops of, of the, for the link layer address means that we can simply remove the link layer address from any list. That's information that I don't have to put in the routing table. I already mentioned that there were many dragons in there, so I won't expand. The 
uh, option that was described in, 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 uh, in TCP IP volume 2, I guess, of so don't routes uh, that you can set on socket, which is defined as used to bypass the routing table, um, is just ignored on, on OpenBSD right now because we don't want to bypass a routing table anymore. We just want to use the routing table. Uh, we can re-implement it differently, but it's easier to get rid of the old code. And if somebody really needs that, just come talk to me, and we'll see what we can do. I doubt it. Now, <laughs> now uh, for a reason regarding um, dangling pointers, um, when you try, it, it's really related to what, what uh, Ted, you talked this morning, right? You try to access the memory of something that got uh, removed or replaced. And that is really easy to trigger if you start having multiple processors. Because one might remove something and the other want to access at the same time. So there is some trick. Uh, that's, that's basically some computer science um, solution. And one of them was to, to, to use a, a big table where every index of interface, every, every chunk in this table hold the pointer to an interface. So we don't need to use the pointer directly. We just give an index, give a token, and get back a pointer. If the pointer gets cleared, that means that the object is gone. If not, that means it's here. That is interesting because we, we, we already have a lot of pointers everywhere because when this subsystem was written things were not so plug and play there were only one CPU it was much more easier to maintain currency and finally we rep I replaced some function that were using a global buffer uh, to use a buffer pass on the stack that's the last point of this slide now where we are after all this change well it's basically the conclusion of the work, right? And we are almost in time. That's how it looks like now. I don't know if you remember the, the previous, previous scary representation, right? We were here. And we are here, right? You don't need to understand what's on the slide or what links, but it's simpler. It looks simpler. Now, where this is used, so you see that you have two rectangles, right? Routing table and the interface list. Well, in the chunk of code that I was uh, analyzing before, well, we are using that. And the star mean that you are using here, or the there. So we move from three global structure here and basically three here to just one in the whole code path. I'm almost not lying. Some bits are not yet integrated in op OpenBSD, right? Um, this is what I have in my development environment. Now, you can look at the code if you're interested in too on the, on the mailing list we use to share and to code review that. You can even review it if you're not a developer. That's really interesting. You can run it. You can test it. Um, there's still the, the, the second point means that there's still a link between the interface and the routing entry, that, that I, uh, it's not removed yet, but that's, that's a part of the, of the removal of the KEMS hack. And I was lying when I was saying there's only one lookup. I'm sorry. With the diff that I sent, we are act actually in the forwarding case, doing one lookup here and another one here. But that's just some code shuffling to have only one instead of two. Hopefully that will be integrated in 5.7. Well, depends how many dragons this will find. So I hope you will test it. Concluding, we are late, but let's go for a conclusion. So refactoring 30 years old code is hard. But well, pretty good story that you know which person is to blame. So you, could, you will be able, or maybe some of you on future developers will blame me later for having done things that are not adapted to future software. Hopefully, PSD will still be used. Now, um, since uh, the uh, number of people working on this refactoring is me and myself, uh, it's quite difficult to get feedback from people. So, I 
find dragons, every of those chains that are presented break at least one setup. Uh, it's not a feature, it's not interesting, it's not cool. Nobody wants to look at it, and when they look at it, they know that will break something. So that's quite hard. That's why understanding what you're changing is important, and I hope that what I presented here as a slide, that, that can be a complement to to the design of the, of the networking stack on the BSD kernel uh, is interesting because you have how basically it was in the 80s and how it's evolving or how it is right now. Sadly, there's still a lot of work to do and the pictures that you've seen are really simple compared to what's missing. So we'll find a lot of drag. Oh, I'm too fast. That's, what it, that's it. So if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. A year ago, I read a paper about the multipath OpenBSD support and route preferences. In the end of the paper, uh, People say it's very good, but it's very dangerous. There are many dragons. I would like to know if it is, has changed. Something has changed, but there's still a lot of dragons. Uh, if you want to have more detail about that, um, I recommend you to talk with Claudio, that is trying to tame those dragons too. Uh, I'm not the expert on that subject. I'm just here to put more pressure on the subsystem to make it break. <laughs> Actually, the, the citation on the, on the slide is coming from this area of the code. So that might answer your question. <laughs> yes, any, any further questions? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any test results after you make these changes? I mean, how fast is it now? Um, and uh, what actually, h how long it took to make these changes? And uh, you know, what, what pending changes do you have? You said it will be released in one year from today, about, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so three, three questions at a time. Yeah. Um, the first one was, what can you, uh, performance testers. Um, the performance testers I have uh, are here to make sure that it's not slower. Uh, no, not at least, because I'm not interested right now into gaining performances. I'm interested into refactoring the code and si simplifying the code so that we it makes it easier to gain performances. Not do it twice at the same time. That will be horrible. Um, but most of, of the function that I change um, well, most of them. Some of them, uh, I was talking about uh, useless lookups. So f in particular cases, uh, for example, with the carb driver, you, you have performance improvement because you, you do less lookups. But that's really ins insignificant. That's one, two persons. It's not the aim of, of the work, right? Um, you say, what I was saying about when it will be integrated, right? Um, the, sl the slide about where it is right now is a slide that where, uh, how it will be when the, the DeFi sent um, beginning of the week will be integrated. Hopefully in the, in the, in the next weeks or months, right? Um, that's, that answers your question? Any other question? Don't be shy. Gone. Well, let's thank our speaker then. Thank you.